Okay, so we've been going over the last couple of weeks on the topic of church. We talked about you know, church versus the body of Christ. Uh, then we spent two weeks talking about church authority, and then we had um, a good, great sermon from Kev last week about standards and samples. And it kind of fit well with the topic of church authority, didn't it? Just saying that you know, we should have God as our standard uh, and not man, and make sure that we're following uh, God and we're not following a man, because oftentimes people do set up man to be their, their God or their idol. They don't realize it until uh, they need to be hurt by that person or they need to be disappointed by that person. And then they realize, hey, I need to have God as my standard. So we're just going to continue on the topic of church and I'll be sp talking uh, specifically about uh, the purpose of church and, and why we get together as a church here and what the church uh, should be. So we'll just read in 1 Timothy 3.1 um, and we'll just read this chapter and then I'll springboard into my outline which is um, verse 14 and 15. So this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth the good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behaviour, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, but uh, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless, even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. These things write I unto thee, so these are the verses I want to focus on. These things write I unto thee, unto thee hoping to come unto thee shortly, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So we see here in chap, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 the qualifications of a bishop and a deacon. And we covered that when we talked about church authority. But I just want to stress again, we can see that the bishop and a deacon is a man and not a woman. So women are not meant to hold positions of authority in the local church. And that's why churches that are ordaining women and are putting you know, these bishop women in power, they are going contrary to the word of God. Because it says here that he has to be a man, he has to be the husband of one wife, and you can't be a husband of one wife unless um, you're a man. But also the deacons, it says the same. Likewise must the deacons be grave, oh wait, um, sorry, verse 11. Even so must their wives be grave. So if you're a, a, a woman, you don't have a wife, and if you are, you definitely should not be in church authority. Uh, even so must their wives be grave, are uh, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. You know, I heard one person say to me once that, you know, the, the bishop or the deacon, the man must be uh, an example to the church, but his wife and family don't need to be an example to the church. But when you see the qualifications here, do you, do you get that idea that it's just the man, and even though his, his children are unruly and his wife is a slanderer, then he's still qualified to be a bishop or a deacon? No, because the Bible says here that there is a qualification for the wife of the deacon just as the, there is with, for a wife of the bishop, because it's even so, must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. And it talks about ruling your own house well. So it's very important that we hold to that standard because like I said, if we start to slip and start to uh, not uh, hold to the things that are very clear in the Word of God, then uh, you know what, what can you hold to? But I want to just springboard from this verse here as we talk about church. It says, but if I tarry long, 
that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So we see four things in here. It says, uh, but if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself, number one, in the house of God, number two, which is the church of the living God, that's what we're talking about, the pillar, number three, and four, the ground of the truth. I might only get to the first three today, but I wanted to, to touch on those four topics. So again, we, we see in 1 Timothy 3 the qualifications of a, of a bishop and a deacon. But he says here uh, in verse 15, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. So not only is it the qualification of a bishop and a deacon to uphold these standards, but it's also the expectation of every believer to live to these standards. So it's not that there's a standard for the bishops and deacons and it doesn't apply to you men or you ladies. You know, obviously not all of these can apply to ladies, but it is an expectation to every believer that we are up to uphold this, uh, this godly atmosphere. So one of the purposes of the house of God, one of the purposes of the church is to provide a godly atmosphere for believers, isn't it? That's why it's important that there is this standard um, that's upheld in the house of God and there are certain sins that will get you kicked out of the house of God. And we're going to go over those um, today. So let's read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, which is the chapter that talks about certain sins that should be shunned and should be put away from the house of God and from this gathering. And you know, yes, everyone is a sinner. Everyone has come short of the glory of God, but not everyone commits these sins that we're going to be talking about um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 1, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife, so fornication. And it says here that it's, it's reported commonly. So it's not, it's, it's not that, you know, I'm going to go, I'm not going around trying to figure out, you know, what sins are in your life and, and I'm going on a witch hunt to try and excommunicate you out of this church. But it's to the point where it's reported commonly, where everyone in the church knows that you're doing it. Everyone knows that, that it's happening and nothing's being said about it. It's just being allowed in the church of God. This is not something that we, have, we can allow in the church of God. It needs to be put away from among us. Uh, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. So in the Corinthian church, they were allowing this fornication in their church that was not even heard of in the world. And, you know, we live in a day and age where, you know, they've just uh, recently in the United States made, uh, you know, redefined the definition of marriage and allowed uh, gay marriage uh, in their legal system. You know, but we can see back in the day in the, in the first century uh, Christian church that, you know, adultery with, with, a, with another person's wife or with, a, with your father's wife was not even heard of in the world, let alone in the church of God. We also see here that, you know, often we, we define fornication as, um, you know, sex outside of marriage. And that is fornication. But that is not only what fornication is, because we see here that, you know, adultery or sleeping with another person's wife is also fornication. So we don't make, you know, I personally don't believe that there's fornication, which is, you know, sexual immorality outside of marriage. And then adultery is, you know, uh, the sexual immorality within marriage. Fornication is just any type of sexual immorality and adultery is a specific type of fornication. So we can see here, because if we, if you, if you define fornication as only sex outside of marriage, then how do you explain this verse? Where it says that a man has his father's wife, that's adultery, but it's called fornication. Because adultery is like a subset of fornication, if that makes sense. Verse 2, And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. You know, in this verse, when I read that verse, it reminds me of churches that say, oh, you know, yeah, we allow, you know, uh, adulterers and fornicators and homosexuals in our church because we're so loving. We're so, you know, we're so accepting. And, you know, the church should be a hospital for sinners. Th this is what I think this verse is talking about, where they're puffed up. They think they're so good that they're allowing this sin and this fornication to run rampant in their church rather than putting, a putting it away. 
For I verily as absent in body but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good, know ye not, that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. See, the reason why we, we, we need to maintain uh, you know, the, the, a certain standard in the house of God and to provide a godly atmosphere is because it says here in verse 6, no, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. See, if we allow this little bit of leaven in our church, it will leaven the whole lump. You are not an island. You, you are, you, when you sin, it doesn't just affect you. It affects the body of Christ. And that's why we have to keep this, this body pure. And you know what's so important? Because, because you're not an island, you not only affect other believers, but you affect the children in this church. There are young children in this church and they look up to you. You know, whether, whether you think they look up to you or not. I remember, you know, Michael one day was, I think, eating with Simon and talking about how he eats his eggs or something like that. Oh, what was it? He says uh, uh, a snack or something like that. So Michael was saying, oh, you know, he's having his snack. And then before you know it, you know, uh, when, when Simon's eating, he's saying, oh, he wants to have a snack and things like that. But, but my point is, you know, my, my, my children, they rub off you, you know, and, and the way you behave and, and the things that we allow in this church are going to affect the children. So we need to get it out because whether you realize it or not, my children are going to look up to you. Your children are going to look up to me. And we need to provide that sort of atmosphere in the house of God. So it's a godly place for um, believers to be and for believers to grow up in and our children to grow up in. <sighs> Verse 7, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You know, I've often seen this verse taught to say that we ought to keep the Passover. You know, saying that let us keep the feast. Um, or, or that uh, the breaking of bread and the Lord's Supper is the continuation of the Passover. You know, I don't believe that because I think what this verse is saying here is it's saying purge out the old leaven. What's the old leaven and the leaven that's leavening the lump talking about? It's talking about the sin in the church, isn't it? It's not talking about actual leaven and fermentation of bread. Uh, so it's saying purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. So that's talking about the body of Christ, the church here. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So Jesus Christ representing, uh, or the, the Passover lamb representing the Je Jesus Christ, the lamb that taketh away the sin of the world. Then it says in verse 8, Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So the fact that we gather together here, Jesus Christ being our Passover lamb, we are the unleavened bread that the Passover represented. So there was the Passover lamb, there was the unleavened bread that they ate, that they ate during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And now we keep that feast by Jesus Christ being our Passover and we being unleavened, that is, you know, if there's fornication and there are certain sins within our church that we purge that leaven out so that we are the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Verse 9, I wrote unto you in an epistle, not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or with extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. So what is he saying here? He's saying, you know, we don't want to company with fornicators within the church, but not with the fornicators of this, of this world. Because if you were to not company with fornicators in general in this world, then you couldn't hang out with anybody almost, because the world is just full of fornicators. Um, Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world. It says here, for then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother. So this is somebody that has a reputation of being a Christian, somebody that's in the church. So it's not just, you know, a visitor that might be, you know, living in fornication or somebody that's new to our church. But if they're coming along and they're called a brother, then we do not accept and we do not allow them to be a fornicator and to keep... Uh, uh, company with us. 
Uh, but now I've written unto you not to keep company of any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one, no, not to eat. So what are the sins that should get a person kicked out of church? Well, number one, we, we talked about this and that's what this chapter is mainly about, is fornication. So that's any sexual immorality outside of marriage. But, you know, that includes... Um, you know, this includes homosexuality. You know, this is why we do not welcome homosexuals in our church. So if you have, you know, if you have an uncle or if you have a cousin or a friend that's a homosexual, you know, please don't invite them to this church because they're not welcome here. Um, because, the, because they're a homosexual, they're always in fornication because they're not married according to the Bible definition. So we don't want fornicators in this church, people that are living in a fornicating relationship. We don't want homosexuals in this church. Um, we don't want uh, those that are covetous, those that you know, are constantly talking about money and, idol and, uh, and, and idolize money and money is, uh, is the reason why they live because that's going to rub off on people because um, covetous, being, covetousness, uh, being covetous is, is dangerous and we cannot serve God or mammon. So we don't want that to come into our church. Um, let's see, if any brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater, I mean that's... Uh, that's uh, self-explanatory, that you don't have any false gods. Or a railer. See, this is one where we, we do allow this more so than fornication or covetousness. Uh, railing is speaking evil one of another. And, you know, this can be in the form of gossip or, you know, talking to, to each other. You know, it's all right to talk about other people, you know, positively, or maybe if you're just saying what's going on. But you shouldn't be speaking evil of other people and talking negatively and talking down about other people. And that's something that we should not allow in our church and should get you kicked out. Or a drunkard, somebody that's uh, intoxicated with alcohol, or an extortioner. So this uh, talks about people that have dishonest business practices or people that are, are you know, blackmailing people uh, for money. With such an one, no, not to eat. So it's not even that they're just not allowed in the house of God and they shouldn't be here to eat with us, but you shouldn't even go and eat with them if they're called a brother. Um, and we're not doing this because we hate them or because we, you know, we, 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 uh, we don't want anything to do with them ever again. It's a, it's a corrective measure, just like chastening. When you chasten your child, you don't do it out of hatred. You do it because it, it's a way to chasten them and judge them in the house of God so that they will get right because... You know, we don't, we don't run the legal system. We can't punish them by law. Um, this is the way that we can hold people accountable to their sins. And it says here in verse 12, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? So he's saying, I don't have anything to do with judging people that are outside of the church. Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So it is the responsibility of the church to deal with these sins and to judge these sins in the house of God. Yeah, we don't judge the sins out of the house of God and the people out in the world. But when this sin, this type of sin creeps into the church, it is up to the church to make it known. And, and it is up to people in authority like myself to purge out that leaven um, and get it out of the church. Now, what is another sin that um, should not be allowed in the house of God? Let's go to 2 Thessalonians 3. Reading from verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he have received of us. Now, if somebody quotes that verse and just stops there, oftentimes I've seen this verse used to say, well, if you're not doing things the way I'm doing it, then I'm going to kick you out of the church. That's not what this is saying. It's not saying that, you know, if you walk disorderly and you're not following the traditions of man, it's talking about, it says here, not after the tradition which ye have received of us. And in the context of this passage, first of all, it's the traditions received from the apostles who are preaching the word of God. So it's not just traditions that are man-made, therefore you get kicked out of the church. So we shouldn't be kicking people out of the church just because they don't do things according to our preferences um, or they have different opinions on things that are disputable. Um, so we, we can't just take this verse and then just run with it. We have to read the whole passage to see what this walk, walketh disorderly is actually talking about. 
So you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which ye have received of us. And what is that? For, ye se ye, for yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. So Paul is saying here that it's the example that I've set because we didn't behave ourselves disorderly among you. And he continues, Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labour and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. Now it's interesting to note there in verse 9, he says here, not because we have not power, what? That we have not power to take wages of the church. Because a lot of people will say, well, Paul didn't take, you know, take money from churches and he didn't get paid. But they're wrong because he did, because he did take wages from certain churches. He took wages from the Philippian church, he took wages from the Thessalonian church. Um, and even here he says, not because we have not power, showing that he does have the authority to take wages. It's just that he didn't take it sometimes from the Thessalonian church to just show them an example of how to work hard. Um, he also said to the Corinthian church that he didn't take wages of them. But that's because they were falsely accusing him and he didn't want to add to that false accusation of taking money from them. So he took money. He says he robbed other churches to do the Corinthian church's uh, uh, service. Anyway, I'm not going into that in, the, in this sermon. But he says here, not because we have not power, so not power, authority to take money, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly. So this walking disorderly, what is it? It is being lazy, not working at all, uh, but still coming along and being, uh, you know, being part of the fellowship, being part of the food, but not doing any labor, not working, first of all, in the church, maybe not doing any sewing, not, not working to even make any money, uh, just somebody that's lazy and not doing anything. Uh, not because we have, uh, for even when we were with you, this we command you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, Note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So we see there that, you know, if somebody is being lazy and not working at all, and it doesn't mean that if you don't have a job, because you may not have a job, but, you know, you know when you come along to the house of God, you know, obviously, I, I expect you to get involved. I expect you to, you know, help out with the cleaning or help out with the setting up, with the cooking. Um, and to get involved with the soul winning, obviously there's an expectation there for you to do it. Um, but if somebody is not doing anything and yet they keep coming along and they're lazy, you know, the Bible says that we ought to chasten that person and have no company with them so that they will get to work. And verse 15, it says here, yet count him not as an enemy. So we're not, we're not trying to make them an enemy or make it an us versus them, but we're doing it to ad admonish him as a brother, the Bible says there to correct him and to get him working and to have uh, some accountability there. <clears throat> All right, Matthew 18. You know, because with that being said, you know, there are certain sins that will get you kicked out of church. We talked about, you know, fornication, covetousness, idolatry, railer, drunkard, extortioner, uh, also laziness. But... What I want to say about that is, this is, you know, but there's still due process. You know, just because somebody is doing these things, it doesn't mean we just fly off the handle and just kick them out at the first sign of it. Uh, because there is a due process that Jesus Christ has put in place for the church that is, that is used to deal with sin in the church. Matthew 18 verse 15 says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he, if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. So what's the first thing we should do if somebody is committing a sin or if somebody is doing wrong? We ought to go to them alone, right? And address it with them and hope that they get it right and then it doesn't have to go further than that. But, verse 16, But if he will not hear thee, 
Then take with thee one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. So if this brother or this sister continues and is persistent in this sin, then you take two or three people with them and you address it with them that every word is established. Now there's a bit more accountability there um, between that small group. Verse 17, And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. So there are certain sins that will get you kicked out of a church, but there's a due process here. You know, it's not that you just commit this sin and then you're kicked out of church. Somebody should go to you, either me or another person in church, and address it with you. And if you repent of that sin, then you, stay, you can stay in the church. That's fine. But if you continue and you persist and it's still commonly reported among us, then you go with two or three witnesses and address it again. You give them another chance. If they neglect to hear them, then it's brought before the church and it's made public in the body of Christ and in the church of God. And if you still will not repent of that sin and it's still commonly reported, then you ought to be kicked out of the church and you are no longer welcome here until you turn from that sin and get right with God and, and then you're, you're welcome back. So... If, if you have a sin that is reported commonly and I address you specifically from the pulpit and that's the first time you hear about it, that is wrong. You know, that should not be happening because, you know, that happens in a, unfortunately in a lot of Baptist churches where, you know, people are in sin or people are doing things wrong or people are doing things that, you know, the bishop may not necessarily agree with. The pulpit is not the first place you should hear about it. I mean, if he hasn't come to you first and foremost to address it with you and to try and make it right and then with two or three witnesses he shouldn't be bringing it before the church you know that is that is really wrong and that's how uh, you'll hurt a lot of people and you're not following what um, what Jesus says to do here so number one you know church should be a place like the Bible says you know how thou oughtest to behave thyself it is a place where we provide a godly atmosphere and that's why certain sins are not welcome in the church. But number two, uh, let's go to Mark 4. If you remember what it said in 1 Timothy 3, how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. So another reason why the church exists is because it's, it's there to be a, a, fa a spiritual family to believers, right? It's here to be a family and um, that we could have brothers and sisters in Christ. All right, Mark 3, verse 31. It says here, then, came, then there came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without, sent unto him, calling him. And the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked round about on them, which sat about him, and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and mother. So we see here in Mark 3, uh, 31, that, th our, that Jesus referred to his spiritual family as his, his mother and his brethren. And when his physical mother and brethren without, were without calling to seek for him, he said, he looked on the people that were, he was about and he said, behold, my mother and my brethren. Uh, now, if, if you were to do that, you know, with your physical family, a lot of people would, uh, you know, take offense to that. But, you know, I, you know as, as I grow in the faith and as I, you know, and as, you, and as you live for God and as you start to hold these positions, you start to realize that the people here really are your family um, and not uh, your physical family. Because as you live for God and as you try to do the right thing, you try to rear your children more and more, like Jesus says, he puts a divide between mother and, and, uh, and daughter and, and things like that. So... Believers here are our spiritual family. And when we see in 1 Timothy 5, 1 Timothy 5, God expects us to treat our spiritual family here like family. Look what it says here in 1 Timothy 5. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren. Now I believe the elder here is not just talking about the bishop, but just an older man in general. Uh, in the context of what it's saying here. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters 
with all purity. So the relationship that we ought to have between one another should be as close as brother and sister. We ought to treat each other like family here. And that's one reason why the church exists, is to be a spiritual family to you. Uh, I just want to show you this verse in Galatians uh, 6. Verse 10, it says here, And as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So we, we ought to do good, right? We ought to do good to people. But it says here, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So not only is the church our spiritual family, not only should we treat the people in our church like family, but also the Bible says here that we should love even our spiritual family above our physical family and we should do good to everyone but especially those who are of the household of of faith so we ought to treat each other like family you know and this is why i wanted church to be an informal gathering i didn't want church to be like a corporate seminar because i wanted you to come along here and i wanted church to feel like a family get together and this is why you know, I encourage you, for those of you that come, to stay and eat with us after, um, after this meeting here as we gather together because it is a get-together. It's not a you know, watch a movie together and then, then leave and just uh, watch a presentation together. I want to take this, for us to take these Sundays and actually sit together and eat together and get to know one another. And um, here's another point in 1 John 5. Because if we love God, we'll, we'll love to be with his family. You know, we are the family of God. And if we love God, we will want to be with his family. Like if somebody says, you know, I love God and I love being with God, but I, but I, I can't stand his family. I can't stand his body. Well, then obviously you don't really love God. It, it'd be like saying, I love Elizabeth and I, and I love her so much, but I, I, don't, I don't want to spend any time with her. Does that even make sense? I mean, people are like that. They say they love God and they, and they love Him so much, but yet they, they don't want to be at church. They don't want to be around God's people. You've you got to ask yourself, do you really love God? Um, some people might say, you know, I, I do love God and I like church, but I'm just not a very outgoing person. I just don't like being around people. Well, you know, I understand that some people have that nature where they're, they're a bit more maybe introverted. They may not like, like putting themselves out there, being in a crowd. But this is something that you need to grow in. You know, it's just like with soul winning. You know, you might not be a very outgoing person. You might be nervous, but it's something you have to strive to get to. You know, some people might come across more naturally to, to be a people person and to talk with people. And for other people, they may struggle with that. But it doesn't mean we just accept that sort of behavior. You need to grow and you need to strive to be more of a people person and be a lover of hospitality, uh, like the Bible says. Look at what it says here in 1 John 5, verse 20. Oh, did I get the wrong one again? Was it 4.20? Oh, I think it's 4.20. Here we go. Look at what it says here in 1 John 4.20. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. So the Bible's telling us here, if you don't love your brethren that you can see, then it's impossible for you to love a God that you can't see. And you love, you, part of loving God is loving his family and loving his body, which is the church of God. So number one, we talked about, you know, church being an environment of godliness. We want to provide an atmosphere of godliness and an example to our children. We want to uh, treat, this, this, this church is here to be a family, right? To be a family of God and we ought to treat one another as family. And if we love God, we ought to want to be with his family and spend time with his family. And to the point where we, we should actually love God's family above our physical family. Um, but number three, and this is what I'll finish on, it says, how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So another reason for the church to exist is to be a pillar of truth. And what do I mean by a pillar of truth? It means a place where the truth 
and the word of God is exalted and it is made known and it's manifest because what's a pillar? A pillar is something that holds the roof up. It holds the truth up. So it is a pillar to the truth. And you might say, well, isn't, isn't the church meant to be a place where Jesus Christ is exalted? Well, the Bible says in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus Christ is the word of God. So when we exalt the word of God, we are exalting Jesus Christ. And don't ask me how that works. I don't know exactly how that works, how the words of the Bible are Jesus Christ. And we're not talking about the ink. You know, we're not talking about the pixels on this screen here that are Jesus Christ. But we're saying that these pixels or the ink on a page are in a certain pattern to create words. And we read those words. And somehow those words are Jesus Christ. And it was those words, the Bible says, that were made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus Christ is the word of God. That's the third part in the Trinity. We have the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And it's the word that became flesh, and that's the Son of God. That's Jesus Christ. I don't know how that works, but you know, Jesus Christ is the word of God. And Jesus Christ is who is exalted. He is the truth. The Bible says the word of God is truth. And that is what the church one of the things the church is meant to be, it's meant to be a pillar of truth to uphold the truth and exalt the truth. You know, this is why I wanted a significant amount of Bible reading. When we come together as a church, we read the Bible together as a church because that's one thing the church is meant to be. It's meant to be a pillar of truth and to uphold the word of God. John 17 verse 14. I have given them thy word and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now, the point I wanted to make here was, you know, Jesus said to his disciples that his disciples were not of the world. He gave his disciples his word and the world was going to hate them. So when we are, as believers are out in the world, sometimes the world will hate us. The world will hate us for the positions that we take. The world will think that we're weird, right? The world will think that God's word is an abomination. But see, this should not be the case in the house of God. See, the house of God is a pillar of truth. So when you come to the house of God as a zealous Bible-believing Bible Christian, this is where you should feel at home, right? This is where you should feel at home to talk about Bible doctrine, to talk about the Bible, to exalt Jesus Christ, to, to want to you know, excel in your Christian life. You know, God forbid that the day would come where you come to this church and you feel out of place as a zealous Bible-believing Christian. And this is why, you know, I encourage, you know, discussion. And I say this to you guys all the time that I just encourage Bible-believing discussion because, you know, let's say you hear something out in the world or you hear some false doctrine or even something that you, uh, is new to you and you didn't know maybe that was in the Word of God, you ought to have the frame of mind of, hey, man, that's great. I, I want to go to church and talk about it with people and see what people think. You shouldn't have this, uh, you know, how sad is it when you believe something or you see something in the Word of God and your first thought might be, oh, man, I can't talk about this at my church. You know, I can't talk about this in the house of God. Um, you know, that's, that's just sad because the house of God is meant to be a pillar of truth where the word of God is exalted and the word of God is the main focus here. So you should be able to come to a church like this as a zealous Christian and this is where you feel normal. You know, and this is why I love church because, you know, sometimes out in the world or at, at my workplace, I do feel out of place. You know, I don't always get along with everyone at work because I don't necessarily want to talk about and joke about the things that they talk about and joke about. But when I come here, it's people that love God, it's people that love soul winning, it's people that love the truth, and we want to sharpen and strengthen one another, and it's great to come together and talk and discuss and grow and encourage one another in the work of God. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, 
reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heat to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. So the word of God says here in 2 Timothy chapter 4 to preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. So we preach the word, whether it's in season, whether it's popular and it's the thing that everyone believes, or whether it's out of season, it's no longer popular, whether it's labeled as hate speech in the house of God, this is where you ought to be able to come to hear the truth that is not taught anywhere else in the world. So the Bible says here, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So even though in the world, the truth of God is gone and nobody is believing it anymore, you ought to be able to come to the house of God, which is a pillar of truth and hear the truth that is taught in the house of God. Uh, let's look at uh, 2 Corinthians 10. says here, Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold towards you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, so though we live in this world, we do not war after the flesh. So we're not trying to wage a physical war or resist things in a physical way. We do not war after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So our, our weapon, like in Ephesians, is the word of God. We use the word of God to fight the spiritual war. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that it exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And the point I wanted to make here in this verse is, you know, yes, church ought to be a pillar of truth. So it is somewhere where the truth is exalted. But not only do we build up and exalt the truth, but we need to tear down false things. We need to tear down lies and we need to tear down heresies. So not only do we use, not only are we in a, in a war to edify and build up the truth, but we are in a war to destroy lies and destroy things that are false also. And, and just, I wanted to just cover a couple of examples, but for example, you know, in church, you'll hear that salvation is by faith. But will you necessarily hear that salvation is not by works? That it's not by you know, giving your life to Jesus? It's not by you know, turning away from your sins or repenting of your sins? And you know, when you come to the house of God, you ought to hear these things. Not just hear that salvation is by grace, salvation is by faith, but that it's not repent of your sins. You know, repenting of your sins is works. Repenting of your sins is keeping the commandments. Repenting of your sins is heresy. It's false doctrine. And you might say, Victor, why do you keep saying it? Because I love hearing it in the house of God. Because you go to you know, other places, you don't hear this sort of preaching. You don't hear it clearly said what is wrong and what is right. You might hear, hey, you know, it's not of works, lest any man should boast, quoting that passage. But then they may not clearly say, well, you know, people that are saying you need to turn from your sins, that's works. That's heresy. That is a false gospel that we need to expose. You know, we, we, we uphold, we're a pillar of truth, so we uphold the King James Bible. But not only do we uphold the King James Bible, but we need to tear down the other Bibles. We need to say that the NIV is a false Bible, that it's missing verses, that it's changing the Word of God, the, the New International Version, the New American Standard. All these new Bibles that are coming out are perverting the Word of God. You know, the pillar of truth ought to encourage you to be fruitful and multiply to have children, to love children, to value children, to spend time with your children, to, to teach your children. And the pillar of truth, the house of God ought to say to you that abortion is murder, that abortion is wrong, it's an abomination, and people that are killing their own children are doing something wicked. 
you know, you know, like uh, like uh, what's happening in the media these days. I don't know if you guys heard that the U.S. Um, changed. I don't know if you saw that on your Facebook. But you know, the world, you know, it's probably coming soon to Australia. You know, to be honest, I don't even know what it's going to change. You know, because so, you know, they, because they've already allowed homosexuality in our society. They already allow homosexuality to, to exist in our society. Um, so what they do, uh, what is that going to change, whether they can marry or not? I mean, maybe it, it may change the culture, it may change what people who are on the fence may think about it. But you've got to remember that when laws change, laws do not actually change the society. Because that's what people are saying. They're saying, oh, we can't pass you know, this gay marriage, or we can't let gays marry because it's going to affect the culture. I mean, what they don't realize is the reason why gay marriage has passed is because the culture has changed. The culture has changed and that's why people are accepting of gay marriage and we have to change the culture. The laws are just a reflection uh, of the culture. But you know, in the house of God, you know, the world may accept gay marriage and the world may accept this perverted relationship of a man and a man or a man and an animal or two men and, two, and one woman or two women and one man and it's marriage. They can redefine marriage however they want, but when you come to the house of God, marriage is always going to be one man and one woman as long as I'm the bishop of this church and as long as the Bible is the word of God and, it, and it's never going to change. So the marriage is always going to be a man and a woman. Because if we, if we don't define marriage as a man and a woman as the Bible defines it, then, what, then, then why, what is marriage? You know, why do they even call it marriage? You know, like they, they just want to take a concept that God has created and pervert it. Because, you know, if they, they can do, do whatever they want. If they want to you know, go, go, and, go ahead and you know, sleep with an animal or marry your cat or marry your dog and call it marriage, it's not going to be marriage, just like uh, marrying a, a man or a man and a man and a man and a woman. And you know, this, this propaganda that they put out, you know, whenever you see gay marriage, it's always just this clean picture of two men or two women hugging. But that's not what it is. You know, because when you come down to it, sodomy is something that's unnatural. Sodomy is something that's disgusting. I mean, it's putting something into a hole that the, the weight, your, your, your body waste is trying to expel. I mean, it's, it's disgusting. I mean, this is the true reality of homosexual marriage. This is what they want to do. It's not just that they want to hang out and be friends because they can do that without being married. It's that they, that they want us to accept this disgusting act as something that is normal. But in the house of God, it will never be accepted as normal. You know, we, we believe that creation is in six days and the, and the earth is a young earth. So when you come to the house of God, this is what you're going to hear. And this is what people are going to believe. And we're going to say that, you know, evolution is wrong. And not only that, that God didn't do evolution. It wasn't the day age theory or the, uh, or the uh, what else is there, the gap theory and all these other theories where Christians have compromised on the truth. You know, we say that baptism is by immersion. But not only that, we say that sprinkling is not the way to baptize. So see, we don't only build up the truth, but we also tear down what is false. And we say, you know, the Catholics and the Presbyterians and the Methodists and all these people Actually, I don't know whether the method is actually baptized by sprinkling. I think they do. But, um, you know, all these other denominations that are baptizing by sprinkling are not following uh, what the Bible says. And I mentioned one in the beginning where church leaders should be men and not women. So it's not just that we teach what a church leader should be, but we also address what is uh, not right. You know, the fact that the tribulation is before the rapture. Sorry, I'm just confusing myself. So, you know, we believe in a, a post-tribulation rapture uh, and not a pre-tribulation rapture. Um, you know, we, we, we don't just say that, you know, whosoever will is saved, but the fact that Calvinism is false. Uh, and, you know, we expo expose the false religion. So the point I'm trying to make here is that we don't just build up the truth, but we also need to addr address the misconceptions that are out there and teach people uh, what is false. And that is what a lot of churches are not doing. All right, last passage I just want to turn to here is in Romans 16. He says here, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. So we see here that not only is the church meant to be an atmosphere of godliness and righteousness, but also an atmosphere of 
spiritual truth and true doctrine. Um, it says here, For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. And I just want to make that distinction again in verse 17, where it says, We mark them which cause divisions and offences, contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. So it's, it's not just people that are causing division, because sometimes truth will cause division in a church. But it's truth that is causing, it's, it's divisions and offences that are caused from doctrines that are contrary to the things that are taught in the Word of God. Doctrine that is taught in the Word of God, not doctrine that is taught by a man. Because you can have man-made doctrines and sometimes people have divisions and, and offences that are you know, caused by that. And that's fine, you know, you know, there, if there is dispute and discussion about certain preferences, hey, you know, have at it and talk about it and discuss it and let's come to an agreement. But when people are trying to promote false doctrine within the church that is contrary to the Word of God, that's not something we can allow in this church because we want, you know, we want this church to be a place of truth um, and, we, and we want people to talk about it. So it's, it's not wrong to talk about it but it's just wrong to cause divisions and offences to do wrong by people contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. All right, so we'll stop there and we'll continue next week. But just to recap, so the purpose of church, one is what? How thou oughtest to behave thyself. So it's meant to be a place where we have a righteous atmosphere, a godly atmosphere, because number one, it's meant to be a, an escape from the world, right? You don't want to come here from the world and it's just as godless and as worldly as the world, but also it affects our children. Number one, how thou oughtest to behave ourselves in the house of God, so it's meant to be a spiritual family and we ought to treat one another like family. And I hope that, you know, you are trying to build relationships with people in this church and get to know one another and, you know, have people over for dinner and get to know one another so that you'll have that relationship with one another so that you will be like a brother and sister to one another and the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So it's a pillar of truth where the truth is upheld. You may not hear these truths in the world, but we have to make sure that when we come to the house of God, these truths are preached, whether they're popular or whether they're not.